into the message. Can you put Romans chapter 8, verse 1 up? I'm using the King James Version of the Bible. The, the, what I want you to know is this, is that the flesh is a problem in the life of the believer. Okay? So if you don't get anything else that I say, remember that I said that the flesh is a problem. So I, I titled my message tonight, The Cross, and I've used this before, but The Cross, an Instrument of Death. Yep. All right? Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Boy, that's a key. Walking after the Spirit. Being led by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What, what, what does that even mean? Well, I want you to know something right off the bat. That it's God's will that men and women be converted and become believers. Yes. What does that even mean? Listen, real quick. The first time you were born, according to the Bible, you were born of Adam. At the time that Adam, uh, that Eve started giving birth, Adam and Eve had already fallen. Right. And you, therefore, when you were born in your natural birth, you were born with a sinful nature. Because Adam had transgressed the will of God and the word of God. And now sin is contained within the DNA, if I can say it that way, of the spiritual aspect of each and every human being that has ever been born. And I got to tell you something, that it's in that sinful nature that the enemy is able to cause people to fall down, to, to get messed up, to get, you know, for lack, well, let's just call it what it is. To get to fall down, to be drawn away from God, to allow the enemy to have his way in their hearts and in their lives and for them never even to reach their destiny. And I know something about that. Okay, uh, but, but, but listen, after conversion, so then the whole plan of God is that he would send us Jesus. That he would send Jesus, the, the, the only begotten son of the father. The, the one that would be born, and we talked about it in the presentation, but that's the Christmas story. That wise men sought him out, and that they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And, and, and I talk about it all the time, but listen, in his birth, was prophesied his ministry. In his birth was prophesied. Frankincense is the ministry of the priest. Okay. Uh, gold though. Gold is the, is, is, a, is the property of kings. Okay. But myrrh. And they used to embalm dead bodies. Even in his birth. His death was prophetically proclaimed. He was born to die my friends. Right. And God has a plan. And whether or not we believe it or not. Whether or not people want to buy into it or not. I'm here to tell you that whenever Jesus died on the cross, it made the opportunity for people to have a relationship with God, for their life to be changed by the spirit of God. Amen. And so I want you to I want you to know that. And I want you to know that the flesh is the real enemy of every believer. It's the flesh is the problem of the believer. So if you're not born again tonight, your problem is sin. Oh, preacher, I still got... No, 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 your problem tonight is not sin. Jesus already took care of sin when he died on the cross. And, 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 and another problem that humanity has is that we're believing the lies of the medical community because the medical... Come on, I'm a nurse practitioner, I can say that. Uh, we're believing the lies of the medical community and they're saying that all we got to do is get on some kind of medicine and they can fix us. Or we're believing the lies of the medical community that says a man is not really a man and a woman's not really a woman. Or we can believe the lies of what they're, oh yeah, you, you received your, your, your DNA alcoholism from your father. No, 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 you received it from a father, but his name's Adam. It comes through it because the problem is sin. The problem is not that it's a sickness. Yeah, it's a sickness, but it's a sickness called sin. And there's only one prescription for it, and his name is Jesus. And he's already paid the price. Hallelujah. He paid the price. So if you're a believer tonight, your problem is, 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 your problem is not sin. Now, if you're not a believer, your problem is sin. If you are not a converted believer tonight, let's just break that down a second. Let's not move too fast. How do I turn into, how do I become a convert preacher? How do I become a believer? Preach. I'm glad you asked. God sent his son. He's not changing his mind. Right. And he allowed his son to die on a cruel cross. See, God became man 
Because there was no man that could die to pay the penalty for sin. Because let me explain something to you. The scripture clearly states the wages of sin is death. And so therefore somebody had to die to pay the, to pay the sin wage. But you couldn't die. I couldn't die. I talk, to, I talk to Muslim people a lot. I like to witness to Muslim people. And, I, and I'll always get to this and, and, until, they, until, they, well, until they make me stop. <laughs> However they choose to do that. And, and, I, and I tell them this. No, the martyr cannot die. Because you see, there's something called the Hadith. It's a commentary to the Quran that was written by Muhammad. And in the Hadith, Muhammad said this. With one drop of the martyr's blood, all his sin is atoned. That is a lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Because the martyr can't atone for his own sin. Neither can you atone for your own sin. Because you and I are supposed to die because we were born in sin. And the wage of sin is death. Therefore, God had to become a man. Come on. So why? So because he, he, so he created Adam in the image and likeness of God. When he created Adam, there was no fall. Amen. There was no sin on this earth. He created and he said, it is good. Okay, but whenever man in Adam took sin upon himself, now the whole world was cursed. But God created man without sin, therefore it required a man without sin to pay the wage of sin. So therefore God sent Jesus on the, on the earth, amen, to, to live out his life perfectly, to not sin, to keep the obedience of the Father, and to die on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. To pay the penalty of my sin. But if you have not received that. I'm just trying to give you a real clear presentation of the gospel. If you have not received the sacrifice of Jesus. And the shedding of his blood. To die for you. To pay the penalty for your sin. If you have not said from your heart. Lord I accept the sacrifice of Jesus. Then you're not converted. If you do not believe or understand that you are a sinner born of Adam and that you need the last Adam to make you right. And then now that I've told you, if you're unwilling to accept that from your heart, then you're not converted. You have to believe it in your heart and confess it with your mouth. But before you can ever believe it with your heart, you've got to understand it in your mind. That's right. Or at least believe it in your mind. And once you take it and accept it in your heart... Hallelujah. Conversion. I guarantee you right now I could hand a microphone to almost each and every person in here. And they can tell us the story of when they were converted. Of when the Holy Spirit showed up and saved their life. And, and, and I'm telling you, it would be the most beautiful service we'd ever have. Don't tempt me because I'm going to be like, <laughs> I know. Yo, go ahead, preacher. No, but listen. So powerful. The miracle of conversion. But listen, once you're converted, the problem's not sin. That's what I'm trying to get to. The problem, uh, okay, of that sin problem was defeated at the cross. Amen? So the lingering problem is the flesh. All that I want that stands in the way of what God wants for me. The flesh. I'm going to say it again. All that I want that stands in the way of what God wants for me. For me, my flesh, Matt Abed, self, selfishness, a, a stench in the nostril of God. After God has sent his precious son and we're going to sit there and, and live for our own selves. I'm talking about to believers tonight. If, you, if you're not a believer, you know how to get saved. Hallelujah. If you are a believer, then I want to talk to you about you about the flesh tonight. Amen. All that I want that stands in the way of what God wants for me. So let's try to understand this a little bit better. So, so the scripture said, it said, Therefore there is, there, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Amen. So let's try to understand the spirit a little bit. And I want to use an Ezekiel passage. You can actually put it up there, Ezekiel chapter um, 36, specifically verse 27. But before I go to that, I want to remind you of the prophet Ezekiel. He's the one that the Lord said to him, son of man, can these bones live? You remember that story? Ezekiel, the Lord brought him to the valley of dry bones and he saw the, this vision of these dry bones just like stacked up on top of each other. And he had, God asked him the question, son of man. Can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, Lord, you know. 
He said, prophesy unto these bones. And this is what Ezekiel said. Thus says the Lord to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. The reason I wanted to use that is because, see, the word breath is synonymous with the Spirit of God. Right. Whenever God formed Adam out of the clay or the earth and he breathed into Adam, he breathed his life-giving force on the inside. It's pneuma in the Greek. It's ruah in the Hebrew. The idea is wind. I know I say this a lot, but it's where we get people that work in the oil field, pneumatics, air, pneumonia, part of the lungs. Okay, you get the point. Pneuma, air, the wind of the Holy Spirit. When God breathes on the inside, he changes things. When God breathes on the inside of our hearts and our lives, he changes circumstances. He converts. He does miracles on the inside of people. So I want to talk to you about that because I want to talk to you about being led by the Spirit of God. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27, it says this, I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. We need the Holy Spirit, my friend. But let me tell you a little secret. If you're born again tonight, you already have him. He's already living on the inside of you. If you're not born again, you need him desperately. Okay, if he's living on the inside of you already, then we need to learn. Come on. We need to learn how to follow him. We need to learn how to hear his voice and we need to learn how to understand his word and we need to follow after the leading of the Holy Spirit and not after our flesh. Amen. Another scripture is Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 33 through 34. And in this scripture, Jer the Lord speaks to Jeremiah about the new covenant. Let me just say this real quick. Let me go backwards to Ezekiel. You don't have to go there on the screen. You can put Jeremiah up there. Jeremiah 31, you can start with verse 33. But I'm going to go backwards in time to Ezekiel. And what I want you to know is, is that Ezekiel was prophesying the new covenant. Okay? And in the new covenant, what God was showing him was that in the new covenant, which is Jesus, Jesus is the new covenant. His death and his burial and his resurrection is the new covenant. That in Christ, that the Holy Spirit in the new covenant was going to come on the inside of people. You remember that? That's what I said that's what I read. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk according to my statutes and to keep my judgments. Amen. So now in Jeremiah, I wanted you to see it's kind of similar. He says this. He says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and I will write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the Holy Spirit again. See, the finger of God wrote the law on the tablets of stone in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, when a person is born again, the Spirit of God writes the law on the inside of their heart. Okay? Let, let, let me give you an illustration. This might be a bad one, but I'm going to do it. So, when I first got saved. I've told y'all the story, right? I showed up at that church in Berwick. I went to the altar. That woman preacher was talking about the blood. I responded. I fell on my knees. I lifted my hands. I was converted. Okay. Praise God. Well, the next thing you know, I hadn't even hardly started reading the Bible. I didn't hardly really know much about the Bible. But I remember I called my little sister up and I said, dude, people that commit fornication are going to go to hell. <laughs> she said, well, then you're in a bind, bro. <laughs> you're in a bind. Okay. I'm like, no, Jesus changed me. And, and, and she got all offended because she didn't, she, she didn't know the Lord yet. And she went and she told my mama what I, what I told her. And then my mama was like, well, I'm glad you found. My mama's not here. Today. I'm glad you found what you're looking for, but you need to take it easy on your sister. Right? Now, she, my mama wasn't serving the Lord at the time either. Okay, but, but what I'm trying to say is this, is that I had not even understood the word of God yet, but he was already writing his law on my heart because that conversion, when the Holy Spirit comes in, he starts to convict of sin. The problem that we have is that we tune him out. Come on, church. That's what my whole message is about tonight, about not tuning out the Lord, right? 
A believer that is led by the Holy Spirit allows the Lord to search his heart and to try his reins. We talked about that a while back. I preached that one time. And you know, and listen, what does that even mean? When the psalmist says, search my heart or try my heart, search my reins, right? In the Old Testament, they take that Old Testament sacrifice, they cut that thing open and they start digging in there. They start pulling intestines out and livers out. And they, oh Lord, everything looks good so far. He didn't have a blemish on the outside. I could see the lamb had to be without spot or blemish. So it had to be good on the outside, but it also had to be good on the inside. Oh, come on. I didn't plan on saying this, but let me, we think we're going to walk around here looking good, okay, on the outside, but the inside's full of filth and sin, and we're going to stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we're going to be okay just because we accepted Jesus as our Savior one time, but then we turned around and we started walking in sin. No, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God, and let me tell you something, sin will not enter in either. The word of the Lord, I was looking at it today, says, this, that perjurers and murderers and fornicators and liars will not enter into the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but that ought to shake us up, church. That ought to shake us up. It ought to make us be honest on our taxes. It ought to make us be honest in everything that we do in our life. I don't know about you, but I ain't trying to take no chances. Yeah, I'm not trying to take no chances. I, the Bible says that you're not pr promised tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Multitudes, multitudes are in the valley of decision. Help us, Lord. Help the preacher. Amen. I got to preach to myself before I can preach to y'all. Search the heart. Try the reins. The outside was good. Let's cut it open and see what we got. Searching around those intestines. Uh-oh. Got a tumor behind the liver. Throw this one out. Grab another. Same thing over and over until they find one that meets the criteria. All that in the Old Testament was pointing to the fact that Jesus was coming. All that purpose was to prepare the world that Jesus was coming, to prepare Israel that Jesus was coming. And listen, it's kind of freaky, but they still missed him. They still yeah. missed him as a nation when he came because pride had puffed them up. That's actually part of my message tonight. So, you know, when the, we allow the Lord to have his way, the word of God, the law of God, okay, we talked about the law in Jeremiah. The law of God becomes more than ink on a page, right? It becomes more than do's and don'ts. It becomes more than rights or wrongs. It breaks through selfishness and self. I wrote this down earlier today. It drills, I don't even know where this came from. It drills through the mantle and it reaches to the core. It's going deep. It's going, the Spirit of God and the Word of God wants to go deep and it wants to penetrate into the heart of our, into the core of who we are. That's right. God is not playing games, my friend. We live in the midst of a modern church that's just, everything's just so groovy and fuzzy and everything's just real warm and the love is just so comfortable and praise God that we can feel His presence. Amen. I'm going to get to that in a second. But look, God is holy. Amen. The Holy Spirit is holy. Good. good news is you can't make it happen on your own or in your own strength. Amen. The Holy Spirit, what we really need to understand is he wants to help us be holy. Amen. I'm not preaching a message of condemnation. I'm preaching a message of hope to let you know that there's hope and that if we will learn to surrender, God would do a great work on the inside. So he drills down. The spirit communicates to spirit. The word of God says in the letter to the Corinthian church, when you get saved, that your spirit and his spirit become one. Amen. You're saved in your spirit. That's that deep place where God tries to speak to us and, and, and encourage us to continue to walk. The word of God divides asunder between joint and marrow. Amen. Between soul and spirit. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents. Of the heart. That's what the word of God will do. Do you read your Bible? I hope you read your Bible. If you don't, then you're out of God's will. Is it okay? You know, it needs to be okay that I say it because I'm going to keep saying it. If you're not reading your Bible, you're out of God's will. If you're not spending time in prayer, you're out of God's will. We are supposed to be seeking after him. Goodness gracious. <laughs> he carried the cross up Calvary. Beaten, back, tattered, and torn, hung naked on the cross for our sin. Lord, help us. I know you're busy. I'm busy too. We're all busy. Life is busy. We need to give reverence to the king. 
At least put a proverb in there. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Let me hear an amen. We need to at least put a proverb in there. A proverb and a psalm. Something. Amen. Praise God. We start, got to start somewhere. Right? We got to start somewhere. But in order for it to work, the believer must not be led by his flesh. An elementary school level understanding of the message of the cross. Y'all ready for this? If we're not careful, an elementary understanding of the message of the cross will produce a person that is puffed up with pride about their own knowledge of the cross, especially when they compare themselves to other people. That's right. Mm -hmm. And they would say, I used to say this. So I'm talking about I was very elementary. I hope I'm not still elementary. It would be, they would say that to be led by the Spirit means to put faith in the cross. Okay, hold on. That's completely true. <laughs> That's completely true. But let, but let me say this. It's a whole lot deeper than that, my friend. It's true, and it's a simple gospel. But while they would say that, they never allow their own flesh to be nailed to the cross. Amen. Sin was defeated by Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago, but your flesh, my flesh, must be crucified daily. Jesus' cross crucified the power of sin. I must pick up my cross. Now, my cross is his cross. You're not doing this in your own, no. But it's you picking up by faith what Christ has already done for you, and you allowing the cross to have its work on the inside of your life. Look, what I'm trying to get to you is this. We got to get past drugs and alcohol and fornication and internet pornography. Lord knows I've struggled with all of that in my life, so I'm not over here preaching down on anybody. I'm just going to speak truth, and that's all I'm ever going to do, by the grace of God, is speak truth. We got to get past that. Look, look, the Lord has set us free. We ought to not be in bondage to those things. If we are, that means we're in bondage to demon spirits. Demon spirits are enticing our flesh to go in a direction and we're actually serving them instead of serving God. I don't know about you, but I ain't trying to serve no demonic spirit. I'm not trying to give no glory to no demonic spirit. They're over there trying to knock on my door. I don't want to answer that door. I want to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Flesh doesn't want to die. Self wants to live. I don't know if I should really get into this. I was going to, I probably needed, let, let me just tell you, there's a couple of scriptures in Corinthians in chapter two. It uses a couple of words in the Greek. Pneumatikos, okay, means spiritual man. Okay, sukikos, soulish man. And then the word carnal is actually sarkikos, which means fleshly man. So what I'm trying to talk to you, I'm not talking about the pneumatikos right now. The pneumatikos is the, is the spiritual man that's being led by the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about whenever I'm talking about whenever the soulish man and the fleshly man have a rendezvous <laughs> and they get and they get together and they start talking to one another. Come on, somebody, help me out here. See, because your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Right. And let me tell you something. What will happen is the Holy Spirit will start speaking to you from your spirit, and he'll and he'll communicate to you. His will for your life. And then all of a sudden your soul in your mind will start. Eh, that's probably not really the Lord. Or you'll start to try. And then the next thing you know, your soul and your flesh meet up. And they just, they just, they just washed the word of the Lord that was speaking to you. And now every time you open up a door, I'm not going to walk over there and try to open the door. Y'all know the story. Every time we open a door in opposition to God, we're leaving a door open. And then we wonder why we struggle so much to continue to move forward in the things of God. So I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the spiritual man. I'm talking about how the soul and the flesh try to work together when the enemy is stimulating it, right? To move us out of the spirit, all right? And so, you know, we start to, we start to think that it's okay, whatever we're doing. I'm about to transition to, we're about to drill a little bit deeper. We start to think that we're okay because we compare our righteousness to what we used to be, right? I mean, we think in our mind sometimes, I know I've done it before. Maybe you've never done this before. Maybe you've never done it the way I'm about to say it because maybe you never did some of this. But we got something in here for you too, I think. So after all, 
It can't, he can't really be talking to me because I don't drink anymore. I don't smoke. I don't cook meth. <laughs> okay. I mean, hey, this is reality. People cook meth. I, I don't sleep with people. Right? I don't steal my daddy's car anymore and run away to Los Angeles like I did when I was 15. Okay? <laughs> Praise God for that. Okay. But what about how we look down at other people? We look down at their shortcomings. Right? And, and we view ourselves superior to them because we don't do what they don't do. We don't drink. We don't smoke. But our mind might be filled with lust. Our heart filled with anger. And sometimes we can hide those things pretty good. We can hide the anger that's on the inside of our lives. Come on. But let the right button get pushed at the right time in the right circumstance. And oh, baby. Then we got a flesh festival going on and hopefully nobody else gets to see it because it's usually pretty embarrassing whenever it happens, right? right. Y'all, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. The only reason I can preach it so hard is because I've lived it. I've lived under the bondage of anger. I was trying to talk to you about anger. It doesn't always get that bad, but I want you to know that sometimes it does because it's really, it's, 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 it's demonic and look, but the Lord will set us free. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want you to know that most of us can quote this. It's talking about the cross. But when his last breath, what did the Lord say? He said, it is finished. The Lord said, it is finished. The Bible says he gave up the ghost. The earth began to quake. The, the rocks began to split. The Bible says the veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. And the word of God teaches us that that was signifying that access into the holiest of holies had now been made available. Come on. What is the holiest of holies? It's the place where the presence of God dwelled in the Old Testament. With the Ark of the Covenant. With the, with the, the, the tablets of the testimony, which is the Ten Commandments on the inside. And only once a year, the high priest would have to sprinkle blood on top. So that the presence of God would stay with Israel for a year. But whenever Jesus died on the cross, because you got to understand something, the scripture says the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. But when Jesus, the perfect lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world, died on the cross, come on, the veil was rent, signifying you and I can enter into that presence of the Lord. Now, you know what I was thinking of, and I don't mean to be... I hate being a negative preacher. I don't want to be a negative preacher. I want to be a happy, positive preacher. But you know what I was thinking? Most of us know that scripture, do we not? How many people do you think on the outside know that scripture? A lot of people know that. They, they know that, that, that a lot of people know that the veil was torn and that they can enter in to the presence of God. Okay? But let me, let me ask you a question. First of all, how many, how many times do we do it? How often? Now that we have the privilege... To enter into the presence of a holy God because of the blood of Jesus. How often do we do that? And then sometimes when we do, what we're doing is we're, we're running. I'm running in there, baby. Like I, and if you've never been really, look, if you've never really been in the presence of the Lord, I'm not saying this as a, a, a negative thing. I'm not trying to make you feel weird. But if you've never truly experienced the presence of the Lord, especially whenever you're alone, okay, it, it's kind of hard to describe it. But whenever you experience the presence, sometimes it can happen in a corporate setting when the Holy Spirit really shows up in a music, in a song service, right? And then sometimes it can, ha it can really happen in your house. I'm just letting you know. That's how I really, yes. really was transformed, was entering into the presence of the Lord in my living room early in the morning, me and the Holy Spirit, some beautiful time. And so the next thing you know, as soon as I experience that, I'm like, dude, I'm going to get me some more of that. Right? And so here I come rushing in on my knees, praising the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I have access. You have given me access to your presence. But this is my question. Do we give him access to us? Whenever we're entering into his, into his presence and the Holy Spirit is dealing with, do we give him access to us? And what I'm trying to say, that's the perfect time to let the Holy Spirit search the heart. Right. And try the reins. But whenever you're in the presence of the Lord, I don't need, you don't need to come confess nothing to the pastor. I don't want to hear all that. That's, I mean, if you need me to be there for you, I'm here for you, brothers and sisters. Amen. But what I'm trying to say is there's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. 
you can go home and do business with the Lord. Amen. Yes. Praise God. And so that's what I wanted to know. Do we allow him to have his way on the inside of us? Amen. We let him. Do we let him have his way? OK, if we do or if we don't and we suppress his spirit. Then we're being led by the flesh. I want you to know that. So, so, the, so being led by the flesh instead of the spirit, part of it comes from the word of God. How, listen, it's, I, I, use this, I use this analogy a lot. I'm going to use it again because I don't think it's getting through. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is. In Hebrews chapter 3, God said this. My people do always err, eat or are, as God says in the King James, for they do not know my ways. You know what that means? It means my people are always walking in error because they do not know my ways. And so I, I remember pondering that the first time. And I'm like, Lord, why did your people called by your name that you created out of Abraham not know your ways? And this is the answer that I feel like the Lord gave me. And you can find it throughout the scripture. And I definitely know that it's telling the truth. And this is it because they had become Egyptian slaves for 400 years. One of the things that the Lord showed me is, is that when we live in the world for this long period of time, we become enculturated by the world. Y'all remember that illustration that I used. What does it mean to be enculturated? It means that society, it means your family, the music that you used to listen to, your old girlfriends, your old friends, your posse you used to run with, or however you want to call it, that all of that had an influence on you, the places that you used to go, the things that you used to do. You were being enculturated to the world. And if you didn't even know that the word of God existed, because until you got saved, you weren't even converted. But then once you were converted and you began to put the word of God, if it did anything to you like it did to me when the Lord showed up, I was like, what? Now, this is after I've been a Christian for 12 years. I, I hate to tell you. I start to read the word of God and I'm like, what in the world? What are we doing? What is happening? See, when you begin to put the word of God on the inside of your heart and you allow the Holy Spirit to have his way, he re you. You know, I was talking to Solomon. Some of y'all know who Solomon is. He called me a while back. And, and one of the comments that he made, he was trying to explain that, you know, if as a world evangelist, that if you go, if you leave India and you go into Mexico, you can't preach about curry in Mexico. Okay, he was trying to make a point. You can't preach culture. And I said, yeah, brother, because there's a culture of the kingdom. Amen? There's a culture of the kingdom and there's a language of the key kingdom. And we're either citizens of the kingdom or we're not. I've had, listen, you know one of the things, and, and I'm okay. I'm a big boy now. I used to get my feelings hurt, but I don't get my feelings hurt too much anymore. Praise God. But, you know, people used to say, I just don't understand what you're saying, preacher. And you know, one of the things that I realize now, well, yeah, that makes sense because you don't understand the language. That's right. You don't understand the language of the kingdom. That's it. You don't understand what it means to be born again. You don't understand what it, what, it, what it means to allow the Lord to have his way. You don't understand what it means, the flesh versus the spirit. You don't understand what it means to die daily. You, and, and, and listen, once or twice a week, listening to the preacher, no matter how good he is, is not enough. In order for us to be reinculturated to the kingdom of God and to begin to live according to kingdom culture, we need the word of the Lord to, to really be on the inside of our hearts. Amen. 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 And that's just one aspect of the lust of the flesh. Not fornication, not a desire for drugs, alcohol or Internet pornography, a lust for self to live. Pride, a refusal to to die, whatever that is, at your job, in your marriage. Come on, I'm getting a little closer to home now. Really, because we all live it. And that's, that's, that's exactly the point that I'm making. You've been, we've been enculturated. Yes. Back in my day, I probably didn't say, get it like you live it. I know that YOLO's already long gone. Okay, <laughs> Alistair Crowley said, do what thou wilt and let that be the whole of the law. But, but it, what, basically what it is is that it's the spirit of Antichrist that has infiltrated the world. See, because we're moving on from elementary school now, right? Praise God, because y'all are saying, and, so, and look, some of you people have been had a crash course in the Bible, right? And so now it's time for us, at least at this church, because every church has its own flavor. 
And, and, and but, but this church's flavor is to preach the truth of the gospel. And if people will truly, and I don't mean that other people aren't preaching the truth of the gospel, but we're going to we're going to dig into the scripture yes. and we're going to learn what the word of God is saying. And I agree with you 110 percent that most of the time. But if people would get saved, truly get saved, amen, and truly be converted because they would truly call upon the Lord. And look. People may not want to agree with this, but in the modern church that we're living in, most of the time, people are scared to preach. At a, not all people, but people are scared to preach about sin, scared that they're going to hurt somebody's heart, scared that people aren't going to come back next week, yeah. right? And so just like people have a fear to trust God, preachers have a fear to tell the truth. And, and the reality of it is, is that if the truth is told, Amen. And the Holy Spirit will touch the heart and a person truly gets saved. The Holy Spirit, and then you yield, right? And you let your flesh get crucified. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Then guess what? You will grow in the things of God. And the Holy Spirit's yeah. power will grow on the inside of you. Amen. And the Word of God is what does it, right? Yeah. Praise, God. Praise so, God. Let me just say this while they're coming up here. That was lust. Lust of the flesh. That, that doesn't want to die. But, you know, there's also a problem with us engaging in law. And, and let, me, let me just get this out while they're getting set up. Many times people don't realize it, but the old way of doing things was connected to performance. You understand that? Yes. Many people fall in their walk with God because they are trying to perform in their own strength. Yes. They think that the grace of God flows through how many times they come to church, how much they read the Bible, because many people preach a works-based Doctrine. I'm here to tell you it's not about the law. It's not about rules. It's not about regulations. It's all about faith and believing in what Christ has done. And that through that, the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, those things that are in your heart and your life, you bring them to the cross. And it's a spiritual work. It's a supernatural work. It's a miraculous work. Amen. I told them guys at the drug addiction center, and I don't even know if people like this, but it is what it is. I've been in three rehabs, so I'll say it the way I want to say it. Okay, when I preach at that drug addiction center, it's not a little bit of Jesus and, and rehab. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with being able to go to a place like that to get set, to get away from the environment. But if you're not putting Jesus on the inside and instead you're working some type of a program that, that that's not giving you the Lord, not giving you Jesus, that's not going to ultimately result in freedom and liberty. Amen. I watched one time uh, that, that old show. What was that show? Kirk Cameron was in it. Uh, where he put his marriage fireproof. Look, that was a good sign whenever he took his computer outside because he was struggling with internet for pornography and he beat it up with the bat. I'm not even saying that God won't actually, um, but yeah, bless somebody for trying to do that. But that's not going to kill the spirit of lust, the power of lust on the inside of you. That has to be crucified at the cross and it requires our flesh to yield to the Holy Spirit. Jesus already paid the price. Amen. And we cannot try to live for God according to rules and regulations, according to laws. Okay. In our own strength, based on our own. No, it, we have to come to our knees in the presence of the Lord and cry out to God. So listen, as they sing the song, if you need prayer tonight, I want you to know the altars are open. Amen. But at the very least, listen, I, don't, I should never give a disclaimer because maybe it prevents people from coming. But at the very least, if you do not. And you know good and well that some things were spoken to you in this message. You, when you get home tonight, instead of doing whatever you normally do, you, you need to get along with the Lord. And just sometimes just a whisper, just a whisper to cry out to God starts it all. Amen. Because the love of God is the goodness of God. Amen. That brings a man to repentance. Amen. Well, hey.